Well, hopefully our first talk of the day was able to open your mind up a little. And now it's time to dig in deep and learn how to use your tools more effectively, which is why I'm joined by Sebastian, who's here to talk to you about tools and tricks to use when working with AWS. Sebastian, it's all you. Thank you very much, Darren. I hope you guys have enjoyed the keynote. Right now, let's talk about productive ways of dealing with the cloud straight from the command line. This session is supposed to teach you some, I would say, tips and tricks. So don't expect things that are very basic, but uh, expect to get inspired. Actually, at least that's my uh, goal for this particular session. My name is Sebastian Gemski. I'm a principal solutions architect at a company named AWS, Amazon Web Services. Uh, you have my contact information here on the screen, so please feel free to reach out if you have any questions or if you would like to talk about architecture, cloud, or this particular session. A few disclaimers before we actually start. So uh, there will be plenty of opinions and recommendations, and those are mine. So they do not represent any kind of endorsement by my employer, current or the previous ones. Uh, that, that In the title, you have the cloud, but specifically, I will cover mostly AWS. So many of those tools are AWS specific. There are some exceptions, but please be warned. And also many of those tools are open source. So please pay attention to licensing and of course, be aware of the risks that are associated to that kind of distribution model. And the final remark, uh, on many slides, there will be icon of a yellow light bulb. This typically indicates that there is a link. And if you want to dig a little bit deeper than what I talk about and what you see on the screen, uh, feel free to use the link and uh, to, to basically learn a little bit more. Uh, of course, feel free to screenshot the presentation. However, at the very last slide, there will be also a link to the presentation. So you will have access to all the slides and all the videos that I have on those. All right, without further ado, what's our game plan for today? Uh, briefly, we'll talk about why CLI. So what is the developer experience? Very, very briefly. Then I will show you some tricks with uh, all good AWS CLI. So the tools that probably everyone who uses AWS is familiar with. Then we'll talk about uh, interconnecting the tools. So gluing and cutting, filtering, smashing, uh, all the content that we can get out of the cloud. I will introduce you to a few interesting tools that can speed up your development lifecycle, like Copilot, SAM, or Scaffold. Uh, last but not least, I will share some random gem selections, so things uh, that do not belong to any other category, but I find them interesting, and we'll try to summarize with something that uh, may be considered a lesson learned for today. All right, so why CLI in general? Why command line in general? We have all those shiny web uh, interfaces. Why don't we use them? Well, frankly, uh, it's all about the developer experience. So developer experience, it's, it's quite a new term, but it's just the naming. The concept is with us for a long time. I'm not going through all the theory. However, uh, developer experience for me personally is just how the environment, the development environment, so tools, processes, uh, but also uh, people around and the way that we are organized, how does it support my efforts to deliver value? So to create code, to build platforms. So do those things, do those, for instance, tools, stop me, prevent me, make me smaller, or maybe they actually make me faster and they are really suited for the scenario where I use those. So there's a lot of theory behind that. For instance, there are dimensions of the developer experience. There are some metrics. Uh, if you want to dive deeper in the, into those, please feel free to use the link uh, to the white paper that is uh, in the bottom of the screen. But let's get practical. So for instance, how do tools like CLI tools can improve your developer experience or increase your developer experience? Well, of course, first of all, they may be fast. So you are not waiting and not wasting time. They may also, also be extensible. So you can somehow tailor them to your scenario. And also, they can have many integration options. For instance, they can support many open standards when it comes to communication between those tools. So there are many of those criteria. And uh, actually, for this many CLI tools, they are suited for automation, and they follow those principles or those ideas that you see on the screen. So that's why many of those CLI tools, especially those that I would like to recommend you today, they actually increase the developer experience. On the other hand, uh, if the tool is designed in an incorrect way, they may actually impair and uh, decrease the developer experience. So for instance, imagine that the tool is actually not exposing the data you need. So you need to somehow scrape the data because there's no API, no SDK. Uh, 
uh, or maybe for some reason, the vendor who is behind the tool is actually blocking the automation. Uh, they, they actually uh, express some sort of defensive vendor behavior. Uh, that, that happens. Fortunately, these times not that frequently as it did in the past. However, uh, I'm going to introduce you to the tools that are actually supposed to increase the developer experience. So let's start with something everyone knows. And I'm not going through like the very basics, but uh, AWS command line interface is basically your Swiss army knife that you pretty much use on a daily basis if you work with AWS. It's imperative. Uh, you have all the basic information on the screen. So yes, it's multi-platform. Yes, it's just one single client. So it doesn't mean that for all the almost 300 services on, on AWS, you don't have to like download specific modules. You have this uh, automatically bundled. And the good thing is that regardless of which service you work with, you have pretty much the same conventions. So we have commands, subcommands, pretty much the same patterns, naming patterns, and so on. So it's quite a nice, nice thing. But things that people do not know about AWS CLI is, for instance, that using AWS CLI, you can, also, you can actually access not only the services which are about the infrastructure, but for instance, also AI services. So let's try to, for instance, use Translate. So I will use I will use the subcommand translate text and I will try to translate some text from uh, English to Spanish. So I can do this just like you can see on the screen, but it means that I need to memorize many many parameters and those names. Yep, success. That those names are not always like super obvious. Uh, but, and if I don't use those parameters, I just get an error. I can use help and search for those. However, there is one way that can help you uh, using auto prompt. So for instance, if I use auto prompt, then I have this nice auto correction that I jump into the mode when I actually put uh, minus minus and it will try to auto complete uh, and guess my intent basically. So uh, it's, it's much more convenient if you're exploring. Of course, this is not like super convenient when you are trying to automate, but this is very convenient when you are learning. What else? What are the tricks with AWS CLI? Well, some of those services or some of those sub commands may have many, many different parameters. And of course, yes, you can have those very lengthy uh, multi-liners. However, you can also get all those parameters and put them in the input file. And you don't actually have to create this file automatically. You can do this uh, by calling the generate CLI skeleton. And this uh, is available for pretty much every sub comment. So how does it work in practice? So I try to translate again, but instead of putting the parameters by hand, I will just generate the skeleton in the input.json file. Let's display it. All right, it's simple, but it's empty. So you don't see, for instance, source language and so on. So let's use JQ to subtract those empty strings with some content. So the text to be uh, translated, source language, destination language. And I will also remove one more section, which is empty and the validation will not let me proceed without it. All right, and I've have updated an input.json. Let's try to uh, display it. Here we go. All right, so I have all the content here. And right now I can use just this file as the parameter to translate text. So this simplifies things because I can put those files on the source control. I can use a generator to create those files and so on. So uh, using skeletons can also save you some time. Not many people know about that. Uh, it, it's, it used to be a standard mechanism for many other tools. It's also available in the CLI. One more tool, which is actually one more sub command, one more pattern that people are not aware of. It's called wait. What does it do? Uh, some of the commands, especially those which are about the infrastructure, they may take some time to complete. I mean, for instance, let's imagine that you are creating, you are provisioning a new EKS cluster, Kubernetes cluster. So uh, just creating the control plane, it takes some time. So typically the commands finishes immediately, but you can browse for status and verify the status that it's still in progress and it may take some time. So uh, if you are scripting, if you are automating, you would like to know when this completes so you can perform another action. So what you can do is you can actually use the wait subcommand. And what it does, it makes the asynchronous command synchronous. So for instance, you can wait for the deployment successful event and this command AWS deploy wait deployment successful will actually wait until the deployment has finished, which means that yes, this time will be like wasted in waiting, but your purpose here, your goal here is to make script synchronous. So that's actually what you are looking for. So how does it work in practice? 
Yeah, let's try to set up some bucket, S3 bucket. Uh, yeah, let's put the default region, use central one in an environment variable. And right now let's create a bucket with some default configuration. And my goal here in this demo will be to actually have a delayed command of putting an object into bucket after few seconds and in the par in parallel I will have a command that just waits for this object put in the bucket. So okay we have the bucket in place already. Let's list the objects. We should see nothing because the bucket has just been created. Yep, it's empty. Uh, so yeah that's how I will make the delayed comments. Just sleep and something and just put it in the background. So here after six seconds I get blue echoed on the terminal. So in sleep 25, in 25 seconds I will put an S3 object, uh, an object into S3 bucket. The object is called input.json. Yep, it's running in the background and right now I uh, use the wait command until the object exists. And I'm looking, I'm waiting for input.json. So we are waiting a few more seconds and yes, here we go. And uh, I can list it and this should be visible. Yep, perfectly. We have the object in the bucket. So you can use this pattern. You can use wait pattern with the commands that typically take some time, especially those ones that provision something. Uh, making uh, asynchronous synchronous sometimes is actually maybe counterintuitive useful. What else? We can also, of course, mess with the format because all you've seen right now when it comes to the output format was JSON. But you can use YAML, you can actually stream YAML, uh, you can use text, and you can use human readable table. Uh, you have, of course, full control of the, the pagination, and also you can use filtering. So I used JQ for filtering. You can use YQ if you prefer YAML. However, JMS Puff, uh, JSON query language, is also supported and is directly supported as an add-on to all of those AWS CLI queries. So maybe let's keep the demo just for the sake of time. Uh, feel free to try it yourself or feel free to check the presentation later and check the demo on your own. Uh, so I've showed you a few, ex few particular modules. So for instance, that you can interact with S3 and they are like literally hundreds of those modules. But there's one specific which is actually quite interesting and it's called cloud control. What is cloud control about? Because if if you think about those modules, of course, modules are about different resources, so different services, concepts. So for instance, in S3, you have buckets. In EKS, you may have clusters. Uh, in ECS, you may have uh, instances, you may have containers and uh, images and so on. Uh, so there is no common ground, common denominator when it comes to what you're working upon. For instance, there's no one single command to list all the cloud resources. So uh, cloud control is exactly about that. Cloud control is about providing one generalized high level abstraction layer, uh, which treats all the cloud resources in exactly the same way as resources. So you, for instance, has one, have one command to list all the resources that meet certain criteria regardless of which AWS service they are coming from. Uh, it's a nice thing, especially if you are, for instance, scripting, automating, and building some tools, maybe some development tools, maybe some governance tools, which uh, uh, should uh, be able to like browse all the resources in your accounts. So here we have the basic API for this uh, for this particular command. It's like super basic. It's basically crude Bruce list. <laughs> so create, delete, uh, get, uh, and update uh, plus uh, list. Uh, what's interesting, this is not read only. You can actually send patch documents, which are asynchronous requests, and modify the resources in this way. Let's see how it works in practice. Again, I will start with setting environment variable for my region. Uh, and right now, let's try to get one particular type of resource. Uh, how about the big cluster parameter group? And I have one particular one on my mind. Here's the name. Yes, I've checked before that it exists. And right now I would actually try, I'd like to get its properties because its properties, it's just a string that can be later processed. So, uh, and let's see how it works. Wow, I have plenty of those pro pro uh, properties. So uh, maybe uh, let's try to make them, uh, put them in more malleable form in CSV. Uh, it's hard to work with because I have two rows, the rows of uh, keys and rows of values. So let's use Miller MLR to actually transform it. 
And maybe, for instance, let's try to um, let's try to use some piping to uh, use uh, uh, to put it, convert it into a CSV and transpose the value. So I have a list of key values instead of uh, one huge row with keys and one huge row with values. And I will use one single trick here. Uh, if you have noticed, I've I didn't just transpose. Uh, I didn't just transpose. Oh, sorry for that. I've actually advanced it a little bit too much. Yeah. So if you noticed where, what I'm doing here is I'm actually uh, transposing the data. And in the very end, I will use the tool which is called Ultimate Plumber. What Ultimate Plumber does, it takes the piped command and it doesn't finish it. It just updates the output uh, when I modify my command. So here we have, I la I'm labeling those two values and I'm in the Ultimate Plumber. So you see that, you see the pipe here and you see the command that I will be running. So I, right now I have the list of keys and values. Each line is a key and a value. And right now I will try to work on that. I will try to filter that. I will try to get the information I'm looking for, browsing all the metadata for this particular resource that I've received via the Cloud Control API. So uh, yeah, for instance, let's get all the items which are about yeah RDS suffix, a log suffix, or maybe which are about cron. And let's try to format them a little bit nicer in a little bit nicer way. So yeah, so uh, as you can see, cloud control is very useful when you are actually trying to look across many resources of different types. And when you want to get, even when you want to get some metadata, which is very specific to this particular resource, because you can get this metadata, you can parse this as JSON in like another layer of processing, and you can do whatever you want. Of course, you don't have to use Ultimate Plumber. I just used it for the sake of, uh, of uh, speeding up typing in this case. Uh, this may look tricky because having one generic abstraction which is created just for this purpose means that you need to learn that abstraction. But what we, if we could uh, achieve exactly the same goal, but for instance, by using SQL. So yes, there is a tool which is called Steampipe. It's a third party tool, it's open source. Uh, you can find a link here on the, uh, in, on the screen. And the idea for this tool is actually, actually to browse the APIs and services as a relational database. And by APIs and services, I don't mean just AWS, no, because this tool is modular. It actually supports many different plugins. And those plugins are, uh, for instance, uh, there are plugins for particular cloud providers, not only AWS, but also there's a plugin for Kubernetes. So which means that you can explore your Kubernetes resources just by using SQL. Let's see how it works in practice. So I, I run into the interactive mode here. And here you can see that I'm just running the SQL command for my buckets. I've just listed, I have 17 buckets. What about getting a particular bucket? I, as you can see, there's a nice, a nice app to complete as well. So yes, I use like, and it works. Nice. Uh, all right. So uh, if I could just, uh, for instance, use grouping, which would be really nice. Yeah, that's also possible. I've just grouped my buckets by the region they are in. And I don't have to define the schema here. The schema is defined automatically because I've attached the plugin. I, it supports aliasing. And how about joining? Let's try to join two tables, two that makes a lot of sense together, like subnet and VPC. So I'm joining right now the subnet and VPC. And let's see if it works. Yep, yep, I was able to join my VPCs with the subnets which belong to them. So uh, the interesting thing is that uh, if you have concepts which are coming from different worlds, like from different plugins, for instance, AWS and Kubernetes, still, you can join those. So we can treat this all as one single database. And you don't have to provision any, any database on your own to run Steampipe. This is actually uh, like completely transparent. You just install Steampipe and it just browses whatever you have parameterized in plugins. All right, cool. Uh, let's imagine a, a different scenario. In, in many cases, when you're trying to set up something, uh, you're making a lot of experiments and you want to measure things. For instance, you want to micro benchmark. So what are the typical latencies here? Am I reaching my goals? If I'm, for instance, optimizing for latencies. So for such micro benchmarking, uh, typically what we do, we use some logs or we use time in a console, but there's a better way. 
And this better way is called Hyperfine. It's a tool for micro benchmarking, which is not super sophisticated, but it's just enough. <laughs> At least in my case, I use it very frequently. So how does the Hyperfine work? Uh, yeah, so I have, as I've mentioned, typically we just use time. So in this case, I will be measuring the operation of listing the objects in a bucket. Yeah, that doesn't make much sense, but I just needed to put some operation here. So yeah, we have an operation we use time twice. And right now we could just get those numbers and calculate it. But instead of that, I could use hyperfine. So I embed the same command in a hyperfine. And what hyperfine does uh, actually is, as you can see right now, Let's see uh, when it finishes. Yeah, so what it really did is it run executed this command, but not once, it did it 10 times. And it put some basic information about the uh, variation and standard deviation and about the mean. And you also have the range. So how much time it took to run this particular command? What was the minimum? What was the maximum? All right. It's nice. It's, it's I would say it really corres corresponds to the major standards of statistics. <laughs> Uh, but it can be made better because what, for instance, if the initial run of the operation, it, it has some initialization uh, and this will be cached later. So each subsequent run will be faster, which means that the first one will actually affect our measurement. So is it possible to have some warm up runs automatically within a hyperfine? Why not? So it's possible. It's in the syntax. So let's see how it works. Uh, I'm doing exactly the same thing. So hyperfine, I'm embedding the same command and the difference is in the parameters. Minus W means minus warm up. So I have two rounds of a warm up and then five rounds of actual test. All right, it works. Uh, well, let's do something even more interesting. What if we could run the test for few input parameters comparatively, like few sessions? Uh, and here I will be running the same command for three different regions. My parameters are is a region and the values are, as you can see here. So as you can see, uh, there are few three separate benchmarks, each run for a different region. So we can just run uh, after we run them, all of them, we, have, we can just compare the results. So this is for EU Central 1, EU West 1, EU is two. So uh, yeah, that, that's, how, that's how it worked. Uh, what about even more sophisticated scenario? For instance, let's imagine that we have some, actually we need to spawn some resources to initialize the test and we should decommission them after the test is done. So yes, there are also switches for that. So uh, for instance, in this case, uh, I'm going to use FS3 bucket, but this bucket doesn't exist. So as you can see right now, we have an error. There is no bucket. So let's try to use hyperfine, but uh, with some switches. Minus S stands for setup. And this is the initial command that is being run when the hyper, before the hyperfine starts the tests. And minus C, which you will see just in a second, is the cleanup command. So what will happen after the test is being conducted? Yes, minus C, you can see it right now. Uh, so yeah, I will be running again the command of listing all the objects. However, I will do some setup and cleanup after the whole operation. Uh, so how does it work? We are almost done here. Yep, we are running five runs and we have the result. But still, let's try to list the objects in the bucket again. And this will, yes, this will fail. Why so? Because we had a cleanup operation, which means that we are cleaning after what we've done. And is, does, is it really a game changer? Maybe not. However, it's very useful for automation because automation will not leave any trash after, after uh, some test that is uh, put inside, embedded inside this automation. And on the other hand, there will be no random errors because the, you are trying to create something that already exists. Cool. Uh, so we know how to get data out of the cloud. We know how to process it a little bit, bit tailor it, like uh, filter it with JQ or with JSMath or uh, change it with Miller, whatever. But sometimes uh, the data we put on our screen, which is just textual data, is not like 100% readable, comprehensible. It's still better to, for instance, use web applications. So can we actually improve this, the readability by using some smart visualiza visualization in the command line. Of course we can. My two favorite libraries, which are very, very simple, are Spark and Uplot. So Spark basically is about visualization in a single line with using icons, 
which represent completeness of something. So uh, the, the best way to use Spark or the, use, the best usage scenario for Spark is actually, for instance, in your power line. If you are customizing your power line and you, for instance, want to have a visualization of uh, how much of a quota you use or, or, or how much of a budget you use or something like that, then Spark is your friend. Uplot is more sophisticated because it's about plotting in two dimensions. So let's see how it works. Uh, a Spark demo will be very uh, simple. So here we have the Python script. What this Python script does, it just takes a single parameter. So how many numbers do I want to generate? And then it generates random numbers, which are not 100% random because they follow the Gauss distribution, just to, for some let's say clarity. And then what it does is just prints them out to the console. So uh, let's see how it works. It's super simple. Yeah, let's run the script. Yep, 10 numbers, here we go. Great, so let's try to use Spark and visualize those numbers. So what we have here right now, it's generated yet another 10 numbers and for them they it normalized it so it took the maximum of those numbers and it has treated it as a full height of the row and it has approximated all the other ones to 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 uh to create some sort of a you would say a bar chart in a single line so just like i said it's very useful when you are running this for instance in your power line but what about uplot? Uplot is more interesting. So if you use the same data for uplot, you can see that you can create the bar chart in your console. It can be useful. You can also create the line chart. And in this case, it has actually used the green color. So it's not like super clear, but you can see some plot hopefully here on the screen. Uh, what about the histogram? Is it possible to use the histogram? Yep. Here I have very few buckets and only 10 numbers, so it's not very useful. But if we generate, for instance, 1000 numbers, and if we use more bins, then it would be much better. Yes, you can see the Gauss distribution right now, hopefully. So it, it uh, proves the uh, correctness of my script. Uh, you, we can, of course, also, uh, yeah, for instance, uh, here I've generated a lot of numbers and I've sorted it and then made them into plot. It's actually, there was a mistake in, in the middle because as you can see, there is some disturbance because unfortunately the sort uh, works on the text. And in this case, uh, that there were no leading zeros. So I fixed that by adding the switch human numeric sort. And right now you should be seeing uh, pretty much what we would expect from the ghost distribution. All right, so these were very simple visualizations. Uh, and uh, I, as I mentioned, there are 100 modules and which, are, which ones of those modules are the most useful ones or which I use on a daily basis. So here's the list. So I typically use Athena for querying, so I don't use the console. I can query my data in S3 using Athena straight from the CLI. Of course, I use some budgets. I, 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 I trace the information in budgets using the console as well. Uh, I also create some, uh, I would say, serverless applications or maybe like small serverless scripts for automations in my development processes by combination of free modules, even step functions and SNS. And of course, I also uh, check the observability data. If you are using the native AWS stack, logs and CloudWatch may be very useful for you. All right, brilliant. So that's pretty much that when it comes to AWS CLI, but that's not the only interesting CLI tool that AWS provides. Another one not many people know about is a copilot. What is a copilot? Uh, so, uh, you know, famously, probably you've heard that there are 17 ways of running uh, containers on AWS and there are 17 ways for a reason. So how do you actually pick the one which is correct? And uh, how do you like move and traverse between those and differences between them? So uh, the good thing is that there is a tool for that and it's called Copilot. So basically Copilot is a CLI tool where you just take the definition of your container in a Docker file or just an image that you created before. And right now by using the standardized CLI, you can decide in a very simple way, even following some sort of a wizard, how to deploy and then maintain uh, in, a, in, in a release pipeline, this application in a chosen, cloud service of yours. So uh, basically it's a quality of life improvement for people who are not running like huge Kubernetes uh, installations. They just want to put something in the cloud. Maybe they want to have it like very cheap so they would like to use the AppRunner, but they don't want to dive into, uh, into AppRunner specifics. They would like the Copilot to do it for them.
So we, you see there are a list of services supported here by the copilot. Uh, you see also some features, but let's try to, uh, to, to look, take a look at the um, copilot in action. But first, uh, we need to like, clarify a few basic concepts that are very important uh, in understanding copilot, because there are, there are the abstractions that take like a common denominator for all the um, provisioning, provisioning uh, options that uh, copilot uh, supports. So uh, application basically is a bag of everything else. So it's a bag of services, environments, and, and jobs. So application is typically something that we in AWS call a workload. Environment is an isolated bag of services which have a different purpose. For instance, you have, have a dev environment, test environment, production environment. So typically you have the same services, but uh, in different environments because they, they just have a different purpose. Service is a bunch of features which is packaged in a container containers. And job is like a service, but it's a task which is triggered for some one of job. So these are the, the basic concepts that you should know when you start working with Copilot. So uh, first of all, we need an application to, because we need some sort of a container. So this application will be very simple. This application is actually written in Kotlin. You don't have to know the syntax of the Kotlin. What this application does, it will expose over an uh, HTTP uh, endpoint, translate, a function which uh, will use uh, Amazon Translate to translate the text, hello world, it's hard coded, sorry, from English to German. So we, in the end, we, if we call this API endpoint, uh, HTTP API endpoint, we are expect to get this text, but in German. That's our application. Super sophisticated, isn't it? So let's try to compile it. Uh, we'll use Gradle. And um, I'm using a framework called Micronaut, which really speeds up things and makes things simpler. Uh, so yeah, uh, we have it compiled right now. So the next point will be to actually test it. So let's try to run it in the background. And again, uh, it's a Micronaut web application and I use Gradle to run it. And let's use HTTP to just verify whether it works, at least locally. Uh, it's not a container yet. We haven't used Copilot yet. We just want to make sure that it works. Yes, hello world. It's probably hello world in German. I hope. All right, so let's move further. So uh, the next step will be to containerize this. But uh, here I will use another interesting tool because you've probably expected me to use Docker, but many companies, many people do not use Docker because of the licensing and because some other things, some other reasons. So I don't use a Docker equivalent because you know, in the end, it's still about OCI container. So it's, as high, it's an open standard and there's plenty of tooling for that. So there's a tool called Finch. Finch is open source. Finch actually, uh, is not really reinventing the wheel in terms of re-implementing what Docker does. What it does is it encapsulates few tools that are already available, few open source tools like NerdCTL, ContainerD, BuildKit, and Lima for virtualization, because for now Finch is aimed for macOS developers. So uh, what I will do is I will use Finch as a replacement for Docker. Uh, you will not get lost because these are exactly the same commands. This is like fully compatible or almost fully compatible because there are some uh, differences when you want actually some other tools to cooperate directly with Finch instead of Docker. But from the perspective of a developer who is uh, who was running Docker in the CLI, there is in the command line, there is uh, there is completely no difference. So let's try to use Finch. Well, first of all, I'm trying to generate, uh, I'm generating the Docker file. I'm not going to create it on my own uh, by hand. Uh, uh, fortunately, Micronaut does that for me. So here we go. This is my Docker file. The next step will be to build it. Let's build a Docker file and tag it as sandbox version one, because in the end, we'll be also doing some update. So right now let's stick with version one. This should take a bunch of seconds. And what will we do next uh, when we have this already done? Well, let's check whether the image exists. Here we go. It's quite small. We can expect it like we would do with Docker. And the next step would be to actually uh, verify whether we have the repository on ECR. So let's check this out. I remember the name uh, I've created at the repository name was Sandbox. So let's, yep, it's up, it's mutable, we can upload the thing. So right now let's uh, log in using Finch and just, just as you can see that, it's exactly in the same way as you would do with Docker. So right now we will log in, login succeeded, and we will of course tag my our image uh, in a way that corresponds to the name of repository, easy peasy. And in the end, we will push our image to the repository on ECR because we will need that for Copilot. Uh, 
Brilliant. It took just a moment. So where we are right now, we have the application, we have it containerized, we have the image, we have the image pushed into ECR. So we are pretty much ready to start working with the copilot. So first of all, we need to initialize things. So if we just want to help, we see that first of all, we have an init command and or we can directly uh, meddle with the concepts of the, of the copilot. So um, init is nice. However, the problem with init is that it works as a wizard. So it will ask us some questions, but we will not see how those questions uh, correspond to particular abstractions. So let's do things manually. Let's do them first, first by step by step. So I will actually run init, but not copilot init, but copilot app init because the first thing I want to do is to create an application. So this is actually quite easy. I create an application which is called Sandbox and there are some things uh, which are being created. Uh, this doesn't look uh, good in this recording in your console. Uh, it, it's because of the software I use for recording. In your console, it should stay on the same screen. So you should not see things scrolling down all the time. All right, so I see application already has in, been initialized. The next step will be to initialize the environment. So the environment basically is all the infrastructure that is shared between all the services which will be in this particular environment. So uh, there are some things there, uh, some things for telemetry, for observability, and so on, so on. So it will take a moment. Oh, here it, it looks much better. Uh, the software didn't fail this time. So this will take a moment. Uh, yes, it's free to store our local artifacts uh, because for, for the actual pipelines. So you have the state of your of your uh, copilot environment stored somewhere. That's brilliant. Let's speed this up. Uh, I think that unfortunately I've scrolled the I've scrolled the presentation. Oh yeah. All right. So uh, I haven't initialized, then the next step would be to initialize the actual service. So uh, how what is the output of the initialization? So the output of the initialization is few manifest files. So this manifest file is for the actual environment. So as you can see here, we are running on default. So we have the name of the environment and we have some basic information about observability. So the container insights are actually disabled and that's nothing else is we are just running on defaults. We have also a manifest file for the service. So this is all you have to parameterize. You don't have to remember any syntax or any configuration specific for uprunner, because in this case, what you specify is that you want a request-driven web service. So you specify the pattern, and this pattern corresponds to uprunner. So this is how our tool knows that we want to use uprunner. And here we specify uh, the actual image. Uh, because we, we, we've we used Finch, so we haven't specified Dockerfile because we don't have Docker. Uh, Copilot assumes we have Docker locally. So we've specified image that is in ECR and we have specified some initial resources. And that's pretty much it. This is a generic manifest file for uh, for Copilot, regardless of whether you want to run your containers or in CS, on uprunner or in any other way. Uh, here, everything is commented, so I'm not even using those things. So let's try to deploy stuff. And in this case, uh, yeah, uh, deploy it looks in a very simple way. Uh, I just specify what is the test environment. And then within this test environment, I have full control over uh, what I deploy within this environment. So I can, for instance, deploy my services separately. In this case, I have an ECS cluster, as you see here on the screen, but this ECS cluster is for the management of the whole environment. This is not for the management of this particular app service. Right now, I don't even have this service provisioned yet. All right, so brilliant. Let's try to uh, maybe speed things up a little bit. I just hope I will not uh, switch the slide again. Up oh, here we go. Uh, yeah, here we are, here we are already deploying the service. As you can see, an app service to run and manage your containers. So the create is in progress, and let's try to speed things up again. Uh, cool. We're almost there. No, we're not. Unfortunately, sharing it on a full screen didn't work. Uh, sorry for that. Need to scroll a few slides back. Uh, 
Yeah, so we have it deployed. So let's verify whether our, our status, our, our our service actually works. So uh, here's the here's the, here are the logs. Here's the status. So the service is running. Send max mark by service sandbox v1, and we can even see some system logs. Everything has been deployed correctly. So let's use HTTP to verify whether our service runs, whether it's available. What we have here is eh, hello vault. So uh, it's right now deployed in AppRunner. It's right now deployed in the cloud. Uh, what, what if we wanted to actually deploy the new version? So let's verify the file uh, again, the controller file, because we've made an adjustment in the meantime. The adjustment is in line 16. I've changed DE to ES, which means that I will be translating hello world, or this application will be translating hello world, not to German, but to Spanish. So what we're doing right now is we are recompiling this locally. This is done. We will again build a container in just a second. And when we build the container, we will tag it as version two. We will again push it into our ECR. And then what we will do, we will actually change the manifest, the manifest for the environment, for this particular service, and we will change it from V1 to V2. And what this will do is this will actually uh, when we uh, either pa uh, parameterize the release pipeline or do the manual update, it will deploy the new version, the version two. Uh, the point is that uh, it is actually quite smart. So what it does, it does the blue green deployment, which means that uh, the, this does not decrease the availability of your service. It doesn't mean that through uh, across the whole time when I'm doing this, the service is not available. Actually, this is not the case. Fortunately, the service will be available and uh, you oh, actually the, the video has just started for some reason. All right. Let me try to hopefully scroll it to the future. Yep. All right, now I'm just running the update and we are almost done. Here we go. The update is almost complete and we can run HTTP, translate and hola mundo. This is probably in Spanish. All right, cool. Uh, but what about, uh, what if we are serverless? What we, if we don't want to run containers? There's a very similar tool called SAM. Uh, SAM stands for serverless application model. As you can see on the right, as you can see the commands, the commands are actually quite similar when it comes to the whole overall model. So what you can do is pretty much the same. You can create uh, your serverless applications. You can uh, control the actual release pipeline for them. And you can actually do a little bit more because you can locally build and test those things. So it means that you can test your Lambda functions locally uh, with the help of a SM CLI, SAM CLI without using the web console at all. Uh, all right, uh, what's more to check? Few interesting things, few interesting facts and tricks. So first of all, uh, using the CL, using the command line doesn't mean that you need to use your terminal emulator. Actually, there is, it's possible to use so-called cloud shell directly from the web console. You see here my web console and you see a cloud shell straight in the web console. So what is this cloud shell? So Cloud Shell is actually a small virtual machine that you can run automatically, and it has plenty of things pre-installed, which means that you don't have to like set up full machine from scratch, and it persists the state of this machine because there is a persistent storage. One gigabyte should be enough. So you can pretty much spawn this uh, Cloud Shell every time you need it, every time you want to run something very, very quickly, even if you are working with the web console on the daily basis. Uh, inactive and low, long running sessions are actually automatically stopped, so you don't have to worry about uh, additional costs. And uh, Cloud Shell by itself, it's free. So what you are paying for is only the resources that you spawn using Cloud Fresh, Cloud Shell, sorry. Uh, Cloud Shell is actually a very, very useful thing. Uh, there are also plenty of tools uh, like Cloudlands or K9S, which are open source and which are not really typically command line tools that use for automation, but they are textual TUI, text user interface tools, which you can use directly in your terminal emulator to in your shell to, for instance, browse the resources, uh, in, in general resources by AWS or specific resources by uh, from Kubernetes. So if you like those su such approach, if you just want everything in your console, these are probably a nice things to try. 
My favorite tool that I just want to mention, there is no time for demo, is called Scaffold. What Scaffold does is Scaffold works just like uh, Copilot does. However, it's a continuous development tool specifically for containers and Kubernetes. So I typically use it for Kubernetes. So what does it do? Uh, you just modify your applications and it detects the changes and it uploads the changed images into the uh, your chosen Kubernetes cluster, which means that the Kubernetes cluster, your environment is evergreen. It gets updated with the changes when you make them. So it's a very useful tool if you want a, a continuous loop of feedback based on uh, for, for the work that you are doing in the meantime, or you want to synchronize the work without the actual release. Uh, yet within your within your team to get the early feedback as well. So again, uh, strongly recommended. It's a very good tool that really can uh, speed things up for you. Uh, feel free. We don't have time to dive deeper into uh, our infrastructure as code stack, but take a look at this slide uh, and take a look at the progen, uh, project. Uh, it's a very nice uh, generator of the projects which uh, help you use your favorite development language to create, for instance, either infrastructure as code definitions or, for instance, Kubernetes YAMLs. So this is something that can also speed things up. Uh, cool. There also a, there's also a bunch of tools which can help you create your own CLI applications. Uh, I can recommend two which are in the bottom. Uh, Inc, which is basically React for CLI. So if you like the concepts that are present in React, uh, you will love it. Uh, of course, the actual components are different because, you know, this is still a terminal screen. However, uh, the actual uh, pipeline of creating and working with those uh, components is very, very convenient. And my favorite tool of choice is Charm.sh, which is, which is actually not a single tool. It's a collection of tools, for instance, to create CLI applications, to record your uh, your screen. Actually, the tool I use to record my sessions here, it's, it's provided by Charm.sh. So uh, take a look. There are many very interesting components which can like really pimp your the applications you create for the CLI. Uh, some more gems. Final final thoughts here. Uh, script kit is a very nice tool that helps you to get command line out of command line. So we are basically able to create and share scripts and run them anywhere without actually jumping into uh, the command line, into the shell. So you have pretty much prompt anywhere. And this is a very good tool when it comes to workstation automation, uh, which really uh, merges the concept from the working with the console with the automation. Warp is my favorite terminal. And the good thing about Warp is that it's some sort of a mixture of a text editor and a terminal. And I know that few vendors have already claimed that do such as a mixture, but I think that this is the first one which is actually successful. And if you are a fan of generative AI, there is something like that, which is also included. Brilliant. Uh, so let's wrap it up. Uh, we, are out of, we are pretty much out of time. So um, to be honest, not using a web console at all is absolutely feasible. Uh, so in my case, I sometimes just get myself uh, really surprised when I get into the web console and I see that the styling has changed because I haven't even noticed because I haven't been there for so long. Uh, when it comes to uh, highly productive, the command line tools, the gluing is the most important part. So the integration, because each tool, it doesn't exist in like a full separation. They all make a lot of uh, difference because of the synergy altogether. A uh, different AWS CLI, it may look like a standard CLI application, like nothing really fancy, but it can actually really speed things up and simplify things up. Uh, for Kuber non-Kubernetes workloads, if you really want to deploy a container really, really quickly, use Copilot. This can also save you a lot of time and you don't have to dive into the differences between ECS, Fargate, AppRunner, and so on. Same applies for, for, for AWS SAM. That's pretty much it. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the session. Uh, again, you have my contact information on the screen and as promised, there's a link to the slides here at the bottom. So feel free to screenshot it and you will access the whole presentation with all the videos and all the links all together. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Sebastian. Uh, folks, we aren't gonna have time for a Q and A section. So if you do have any questions, you now do have Sebastian's contact details. Get in touch with him. Seems like a, a nice fellow. I'm sure he's willing to field any questions. Uh, but thank you, Sebastian. We're going to wrap this up. I think we've got a 10 minute break before our next talk. So take this as an opportunity to get yourself a cookie, get yourself a cup of tea, and then hopefully you'll be back in your seat ready for our next talk. Thanks again, Seb.
Thank you. Have a nice second day of the conference. This is all we got. Think about a revolution in our mind. This is all we got. Lock me out of this life institution. I am angry and I on illusions. Yes, I hate, but it's not a solution. Try my best, but I am just a human. Oh, we don't need to say we're sorry. We don't need to worship ever stop. We don't need to say we're sorry.